Dimensions alone make it one of the most easily recognizable aircraft in the world. The British and French were developing Concorde for international travel as Boeing developed its 747. While the European transport had supersonic appeal, its small cabin could accommodate only 100 passengers, too few to make money. So airlines bought the Boeing as an interim aircraft. It could be used until a large, fuel-efficient supersonic transport arrived. Now, more than three decades later, the wait is by no means over. Meanwhile, the 747 has proved itself to be so economical, so accommodating and so adaptable to changing technologies that it's become the mainstay of international air travel. More than 1,200 of the giants have been constructed so far. Boeing has produced six basic versions of the 747. First was a Model 100, then came the heavier 200. This is the high-density SR shuttle. the short-body, long-range SP. The 300, with its noticeably lengthened upper deck. And then the 747-400, which has distinctive winglets. In addition, there are swing-nosed freighters and aircraft that can carry both passengers and cargo on the main deck. More than a dozen 747s have been modified for special uses. When necessary, the Pentagon conscripts civilian 747s to move personnel and cargo. During the Gulf War, American-owned 747s carried 644,000 US troops and 220,000 tons of cargo and equipment. The American Air Force owns and operates several 747s as airborne command vehicles and 747s have even proved adept at carrying spacecraft and presidents alike. Men and women of Boeing, I have looked forward to coming here for a long time and I guess what I ought to begin by saying is thank you for Air Force One. You know, everywhere I go in that airplane, I am the second most important celebrity. People really just want to see the plane. Seven four sevens crowd airports across the globe. At any moment of any day, thousands of people are flying somewhere aboard one. Joe Sutter led the team of Boeing engineers that designed it. It's carried a, a significant portion of the entire Worth's population in safety and in comfort and in efficiency. It opened up air travel to almost anybody that wants to fly. Uh, today, uh, it's still the queen of the skies. The 747's first appearance was a day to remember. Boeing engineer Jeff Olson was one of the thousands on hand, and he recalls the moment vividly. When on September 30th, 1968, and to watch the airplane roll out and watch the doors open as the nose of the airplane came out, I had to make sure I didn't faint. And yet, many were hesitant to embrace the 747's huge form. A test pilot who retired as a vice president at Boeing, Brian Weigel, was co-pilot on the very first flight. During the development before we flew, there were a lot of concerns. Uh, um, concerns about turning such a huge airplane on the existing runways and taxiways. There was concerns whether pilots could uh, land it from the great height the cockpit was at. 
Gary Pugh was among the army of workers who helped build that first one. Uh, there was, I think, some concern amongst uh, travelers and uh, the, just the general public that uh, the airplane was just too big. Even Pugh had some doubts when he watched Brian Weigel, project pilot Jack Waddell, and flight engineer Jess Wallach take the Big Bird aloft for the very first time, one wintry morning in February 1969. My uh, greatest recollection of that day was not the takeoff, really, but the landing, because as we watched the airplane approach from the north, coming in over, uh, over Puget Sound, it had this beautiful nose-high attitude, but it, it seemed like it was going too slowly. It didn't seem like it was going fast enough to generate the lift that it needed to stay airborne. Uh, but I've learned to, to accept that now, and I still am in awe as I watch that airplane approach for a landing today. It's a beautiful sight to me. The excitement of the first flight of the 747 was relived when the Boeing touched down at Le Bourget Airport to make its international debut. The Paris Air Show is the most prestigious aviation gathering in the world. In 1969, the show belonged to the 747. Former Boeing Vice Chairman Mal Stamper remembers it well. My proudest moment was flying it to Le Bourget for the first time. We flew her non-stop from Seattle to Paris. You know, to fly it non-stop, we were going to steal the show. And uh, we did. Even after all these years, the 747 is still something to behold. This is the 747-400, the current production version, and in number of units delivered, the most popular. It's over six stories high. From nose to tail, it's almost 70 meters. Just about twice the length of the Wright brothers' first flight. The 400's wings spread 63 meters. So long, they make the winglets at their tips seem tiny. But these drag-reducing appendages stand nearly two meters tall. Its elevators, the movable horizontal tail fins, are as large as the main wings of a 737. Filled with fuel, cargo, passengers and crew, a 747 can weigh as much as 396,000 kilos. Just one wing weighs 12,500 kilos. That's the same weight as a fully loaded DC-3, the most advanced airliner of its era. On average, the exterior paint of a typical 747 weighs 540 kilos. When the 747 first appeared, the size of the cabin took many by surprise. Six meters wide, two and a half meters from floor to ceiling. The exterior walls were vertical, not curved. Rows had up to 10 seats across. It had two main aisles that ran nearly 60 meters from front to back. There were even aisles across the aircraft. There were overhead compartments on both sides as well as in the middle. A total of nine galleys and 15 lavatories. The enclosure seemed more like a waiting room than a flying machine. And for uneasy flyers, that illusion was welcome. Because it can carry so many people and carry them so far, the 747 has the lowest seat per kilometer costs of any jetliner. And that's the real key to low fares. In a typical three-class configuration, a 747 seats about 420 passengers. The special high-density version used as an intercity shuttle in Asia seats 568 people. And if necessary, the 747 can carry even more. 
on an emergency evacuation flight from Ethiopia in 1991, an Israeli El Al 747 squeezed aboard 1,087 refugees to safety. When it landed, it had more passengers than at takeoff. Three babies were born en route. When Boeing decided to build the 747, its main plant in Seattle was unsuited for such a huge project. So the company purchased additional land. Site preparation included bulldozing as much earth as was moved in building the Panama Canal and the Grand Coulee Dam combined. They even had to build their own railway spur. The development program was on such a tight schedule, Boeing couldn't wait for the building to be completed before it began aircraft production. Unfortunately, the weather refused to cooperate. It rained every day for weeks. The factory was built at the same time as the airplane. We, we literally were building parts of the airplane in the rains because the roof hadn't been on in that part of the factory. The Pentagon is the world's largest office building in terms of floor area. But when it comes to volume of enclosed space, Boeing's new building was the world's largest edifice. And so it remains. Even larger today, it encloses 133 million cubic meters, about the same as 500 Madison Square Gardens. The plant's roof is over nine stories high. Each hangar door is larger than a football field. 18 giant cranes cruise along the ceiling, moving multi-ton fuselage and wing sections. Building a 747 is an international effort. The fabrication of the parts and sub-assemblies occurs at factories and shops throughout the world. Belfast makes the landing gear doors. The ailerons and spoilers are built in Japan. Most of the upper fuselage is made in California. And a variety of wing components hail from Australia. In all, some 1,100 companies are involved in making everything from flaps and engines to seats and instruments. The parts arrive by air, ship, rail and road. Boeing even uses a specially designed expandable vehicle to haul the 747's 33 meter long wing spars from a plant 70 kilometers away. The vehicle can extend to almost 40 meters so long it requires a second driver sitting in a cab below the rear chassis to steer the back wheels. A total of six million items, half of them fasteners, go into every 747. Gathering all the pieces in one place at just the right time and then fashioning them into a flying machine is a task as daunting as the aircraft itself. Seven four seven programs operations director Jack Jones is familiar with the choreography involved. Inside this factory, the process begins when we load what's called a spark, wing spark, into the first tool up on a balcony. From that point, it goes all the way to delivery till we actually hand the keys over to the airline, and that process is approximately about five months. We are continually trying to take that amount of time and reduce it to the point where we think we got a robust and efficient process. The largest assemblies, sized assemblies, come from Northrop Grumman down in Los Angeles. They provide the body panels, the aft end of the 747. That comes in from uh, Vought in Texas. And then, of course, we have the engine manufacturers that provide the engines. If you look throughout this factory, you're going to find several thousand people are involved in building this airplane. We're currently building three and a half airplanes a month. The most we've ever built, 747s, in one month is seven. Once a new 747 joins the commercial fleet, it immediately begins to earn back the $160 million or more its owner spent to acquire it. In the earliest days of the 747 program, the payback was sometimes delayed by the engines, or the lack of them. And if you've ever seen almost a billion dollars worth of airplanes lined up with cement blocks on them and you love airplanes, it was a tragedy as far as we were concerned. Traditionally, every new generation of aircraft is led by a new generation of engine. 
and so it was with the Jumbo. The original 747 was more than twice as heavy as the 707, then Boeing's biggest jetliner. To move all that metal, the designers relied on a new kind of jet engine, called a high-bypass turbofan. A high-bypass engine has a jet core producing a thrust stream, but in addition, it's fitted with an extra-large forward fan, with blades nearly two and a half meters wide. These drive air through the hot core, but they also send a much larger volume of air around the compressor, combustion and turbine sections by bypassing it. This cool air then joins the hot exhaust, adding a great deal of thrust, while simultaneously quietening the noisy jet blast. This thermodynamic technology produced an engine so remarkably quiet, clean, fuel efficient and powerful, that it was nothing short of revolutionary. Pratt & Whitney was selected by Boeing to make the engines for its new jumbo. Although an excellent design, the engine was being developed simultaneously with the aircraft. The new Pratt turbofan had teething problems, and the 747 was ready before the engine. And so the new aeroplanes came off the line with counterweights hung from the engine pylons. Pratt & Whitney got the turbofan program back on track and the engine went on to become one of the most reliable in commercial service. Today, 747s can have engines manufactured by Pratt & Whitney, by Rolls-Royce or General Electric. Virgin Atlantic uses engines from all three manufacturers in its fleet of 747s. Regardless of which engine is selected, the price will be high upwards of eight to ten million dollars each. The high price reflects the demands placed upon them. A 747-400 engine must deliver upwards of 25,650 kilos of thrust. Doing that pushes core temperatures above 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The engine must be tough enough to gulp down a seagull-sized bird without any disruption and strong enough to contain the extraordinary energy of a broken fan blade. Meanwhile, it must work hard for 12 hours a day or more, every day for years before going in for a major overhaul. As an example, this GE CF6 has a near perfect dispatch reliability record of 99.96%. Its rate of unplanned shutdowns during flight is 0 0.006 per thousand flight hours. That means an engine has a serious problem in flight every 40 years or so. And on a 747, the loss of one engine is pretty much a non-event. The other three can do the job quite easily. These engines are masterpieces of mechanical artistry. Constant attention to the engines and the airframe ensures they'll perform unerringly. A 747 is routinely scrutinized intensely. Mechanics check the power plants and major systems daily. On the newest 747s, onboard computers monitor systems and help the mechanics pinpoint trouble quickly. And at specific intervals over months and years, the aircraft and engines go into the shop for detailed examination and replacement of worn or time-sensitive parts. These inspections, called C and D checks, involve the virtual disassembly of the aeroplane. One of the primary purposes of such a labour-intensive undertaking is to find minuscule cracks and fissures caused by metal fatigue, an aeroplane's unrelenting nemesis. Without the interior walls and seats, you get an even better appreciation for the 747's true immensity. One look inside the fuselage, and it's easy to understand the 747's appeal as a freighter. In fact, the aircraft's prodigious dimensions were dictated by placing two standard shipping containers side by side. Hauling freight is a significant and growing contributor to every airline's finances. And the 747 was designed with freight in mind. 
The cargo hold on a passenger version of the 747 is large, measuring over 1,200 cubic metres. Specially shaped cargo containers and pallets fit inside the hold like giant puzzle pieces. What they contain defies easy categorization. Virgin Atlantic is one of the many 747 passenger carriers that makes the most of this valuable space. Virgin's David Tate explains. We generally carry something between 10 and 12 tonnes of cargo on every flight. So there's generally standby cargo that's waiting to get on if we, if we have the space to put it on there. When it was designing the 747, Boeing thought that carrying freight would eventually become the aeroplane's primary role once the supersonic transport arrived. The reason they put the pilots on top of the main deck wasn't to create an upper lounge, but rather to enable cargo loading directly through the nose on dedicated freighters. The ramp around a 747 is a busy place from the moment the aeroplane pulls up to the gate. It's well known that aeroplanes make no money on the ground, so the airline operators carefully orchestrate ground operations to set their birds back in the air as quickly as they possibly can. At Virgin Atlantic, we like to schedule about a three-hour turn at the very minimum. That allows us, gives us the time to do everything to the level that we like to do it. We can do it in less, but we like to schedule three hours. When the airplane arrives, the first job at hand is to, is to get the passengers off. But on average, we'll have about 300 and something passengers. That generally will take at least 15, 15, maybe 20 minutes to get them all off with the bags. And only when all the passengers are off can we start doing all the things that have got to be done to turn the airplane on, on, on board. Uh, on the main deck, that will include servicing lavatories, um, cleaning the cabin. It means going through seat backs to see if people have, uh, have, have, have lost things. They will have to replenish most of the materials in each seat back, which can take, um, can take 30 seconds or so per seat, which for nearly 400 seats adds up. The cabin crew have their own series of checks that they have to go through in terms of inspecting every seat to see that the cleaners have done the job. In the meantime, uh, we, we, we have to decater the airplane, which means taking all of the, the catering carts off and then recater the thing. A full 747 will generally carry something like, like, like four tons of food, food and beverage for, for, for the passengers. So that's quite a bit. Obviously, it's loaded in, in containers and, and there's, those have all pre-assigned spots. So it's quite a, quite a well-refined science. And below decks, um, there, there's a lot of uh, technical things going on. The passengers like to arrive with their bags. So while they're coming off, we're, we're, we're already unloading the cans underneath them. On average, a 747 flight carries 500 pieces of luggage or more in its belly. Once the aeroplane arrives at its destination, these have to be removed quickly and brought to baggage claim. Once a jumbo has unloaded, the process immediately reverses. The powerful main deck loaders lift shipping containers filled with cargo and passenger bags up to the cargo doors. Automatic rollers slide the containers into place where they're secured. Meanwhile, the waste system is emptied. Tanker trucks pump up to 6,000 litres of jet fuel aboard. The first officer does the walk-around inspection, looking for anything out of the ordinary. Then he joins the captain on the flight deck for their final pre-flight checks. Meanwhile, flight attendants prepare for the 400 passengers. When all of those are comfortable with the state of the cabin and the state of the airplane, we we'll give the word to our ground crew that we're ready to board the airplane. Boarding a 747 is quite a long process. You can board one passenger every five seconds, and so generally speaking, you need a full 30 to 45 minutes to board it, simply to get the passengers on board the airplane. And that's before you get them bedded down with seat belts on and everything stowed. As soon as the cargo is secured and passengers settled, it's time for pushback.
Every 747 journey begins with pre-flight planning. Here, Virgin Atlantic pilots Steve Hallett and Bob Bees arrive at the airline's flight dispatch office at Heathrow, hours before scheduled departure to New York. They review data on airport conditions, passenger and cargo loads, and fuel requirements. They also study weather and wind information for the planned route. The aircraft's original range of 8,500 kilometers has increased steadily over the years, and now the 747-400 can go 13,000 kilometers. That's a third of the way around the globe, without refueling. London to Singapore, LA to Hong Kong, New York to Tokyo, LA to Sydney. Traditionally, flight planning calculations such as takeoff and climb speeds, equal time points and alternate airport selection rested largely with the flight crew. But with computerized weather models, satellite weather monitoring and real-time global reporting of conditions aloft, many airlines today let machines do most of the prep work. The pilots review the computer-generated plan, highlight their planned route and checkpoints and then proceed to the aircraft. The cockpit checks are completed and clearance received. The aeroplane is ready to depart. After lifting off from Heathrow at 2 p.m. local time, pilots Hallett and Bees will turn their 747 west and head out over the Atlantic on what will be a seven-hour, 40-minute flight to New York's JFK International. At cruise altitude, with the autopilot on, the crew monitors their aircraft's myriad systems. Early 747s had nearly a thousand instruments, lights and switches to help its two pilots and flight engineers stay informed and in control. On the 400, that number has been reduced to 365, largely due to the introduction of digital instrumentation. This revolution has also eliminated the flight engineer. On the 400, the pilot and co-pilot do it all. To help them, the vast majority of information is concentrated on television-like screens called cathode ray tubes. Four deliver flight information. These are the pre-flight and navigation displays. Two others, called ICAS, the engine indication and crew alerting system, monitor the engines and other systems. This is the primary flight display. This shows all the instruments that would normally be on the, on the flight instrument T. Here is the indicated airspeed on the left, the compass rows underneath, the altimeter on the right, and in the center is the artificial horizon. This is called the upper ICAS display. It normally displays the engines. This is the temperature of the engines, and these are the revolutions of the fan which produces a thrust of the engine. This is the autopilot control panel. The left autopilot is in command. We've selected an altitude of 34,000 feet. We've selected lateral navigation from the flight management system and vertical navigation from the flight management system. You're talking about the navigation system. Uh, what we have on this aircraft, which is excellent, is well, we have two global positioning systems, uh, the GPS. And if you look here, they're showing the position exactly on the nose of this aeroplane, so they're that accurate. And that's by doing satellite triangulation to give us a good fix. The TCAS, which actually stands for Traffic Collision Avoidance System, which shows us where other aircraft are relative to us. Bearing in mind we are now in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, we have here one aircraft who's uh, 22 miles ahead of us, 2,000 feet below us, an aircraft 1,000 feet above us, and an aircraft 2,000 feet above us, and another one who's 1,000 feet below us. Now, this is all within 40 miles. This is ACARS. This is a, an automated uh, message system which will give printouts. We can send and receive messages, and we can also receive weather. Any weather report we receive will be printed out on this printer here. Today, the 747 is almost fully automated. Shortly after raising the landing gear, the pilots switch on the autopilot and then oversee the proper functioning of the aircraft systems and their progress along the planned route. The computerized flight director can fly more precisely than any human. 
In fact, the pilots can tell the autopilot the time and altitude they want to be at a certain point, and the computer will adjust power and flight path accordingly. As the hands-free, super-long-range aircraft was evolving, Boeing engineers had a new worry. Lynn Flint, chief engineer of systems on the 747, explains. The 747 flies so far that there was concern that the crew wouldn't be alert. And so we added a crew alertness system. Basically, if the crew doesn't interact with the systems, every 15 or 20 minutes, they get either an aural or a visual warning. There's a footnote to describing the 400 as a two-pilot aeroplane. This newest 747 can easily fly 15 or 16 hours without refueling. Although pilots typically have 12 hours or more of rest before every long-distance flight, they're usually restricted to eight hours of flying on any single day. Consequently, backup crews are carried to relieve the primary pilots in flight. There's a tiny bunk room in the rear of the flight deck where the off-duty pilots can sleep. At many airlines, flight pay increases with the size of the aeroplane flown. Consequently, the 747 traditionally attracts the most senior, most experienced crews. Some veteran captains with well-established international carriers can earn more than £150,000 a year. But compensation notwithstanding, the big Boeing would still draw eager pilots because despite its stupendous bulk, it's still surprisingly nimble and forgiving to fly. I've been very fortunate. I've flown all models of the 747, and I've been flying 747 since 1982. Uh, the 747-400 is, is certainly the best of the aircraft I've flown. It flies faster than any other commercial aircraft other than Concorde. It has a lot of fail-safe and backup systems. It's certainly probably the most reliable aircraft in the world that we have nowadays. But when I was told I was going to be, go on the 747-400, it was the absolutely greatest thing that had happened to me, and I've certainly enjoyed every moment of it ever since. Because of the 747's size and the high number of passengers it was to carry, Boeing insisted that the Superjet was particularly safe. Throughout, there were numerous systems redundancies. When we were asked to design such a large airplane, Boeing and everybody was concerned about the impact of an accident for that airplane. So safety was really foremost on our mind. We designed for redundancy and a strong structure. For instance, the, the wing has three spars in it. The only airplane I know with three wing spars. All of the systems are quadruple. Four hydraulic systems, four generation systems. The landing gear has four legs to it. The only airplane with four legs to the landing gear. One of the reasons is the airplane could come home and make a safe landing even if one landing gear was torn off or would not come down. Redundancy included doubling up on the moving surfaces designed to control the giant in the air. The rudder, elevators, and ailerons were split, so if one failed, there'd always be a backup. Sutter's team also fitted the aircraft with triple-slotted flaps and leading-edge devices. With those, the 747, then and still the fastest subsonic jetliner, became eminently flyable at slow speeds as well. The 747's superb handling at low speeds results from a combination of factors, including its triple-slotted flaps, leading-edge slats, and its bulk. John Cashman is Boeing's chief test pilot. The larger the size of the aircraft, the more stable it is in turbulence. Uh, and also, uh, it, it doesn't divert from its flight path other than by direct flight control input from the pilot. So when you set it on a path, it tends to stay there. And it makes it easy to fly because of that. And to further ensure aircraft safety, the pilots undergo training sessions in cockpit simulators every year. The training extends to the cabin crew as well. Regulations state that a downed airliner has to be cleared of passengers within 90 seconds. Not an easy task. I had that up. I've evacuated a jumbo once and um, 
you have to be prepared for that every time you fly. Hey, I was only a junior flight attendant at the time, but it's such a good feeling afterwards, having evacuated the jumbo, knowing that you can do it. But accidents do occur. To help determine what went wrong, there's a microphone in the overhead instrument panel that picks up the pilot's conversations and radio transmissions for storage in an audio recorder in the tail. Similarly, there's a device that continuously monitors and records the performance of the aeroplane and its subsystems. These recorders are commonly known as black boxes. Uh, the airplane, after 30 years, is one of the safest airplanes uh, flying. For most passengers, flight safety has long been presumed, and their foremost concern en route is the matter of personal comfort. With the arrival of the big cabin 747, airlines had the opportunity to improve things for the passengers. On early 747 flights, there was lavish food, services, and even films. Suddenly, flying long distances became more tolerable. Today's business class passengers can have manicures in flight and massages. The aeroplane is so big, there's even a bar to complement the luxury food. The latest 747s are equipped with passenger conveniences and entertainments unimagined when the aircraft was first conceived. Moving maps let passengers watch their flight's progress. And video games keep children amused. And in the passenger cabin, we've gone from piano bars and decks of cards to in-seat in-flight entertainment, where you can choose which movie you want to watch, make a phone call, send a fax, or even plug your PC in. We have a choice of up to 16 movies on most of our aircraft. We also have Nintendo games, interactive games, so if you're traveling with young kids, you basically just plug them in and forget about them for six or seven hours. I tell you, it's the greatest way to fly with children. The Jumbo's arrival probably had more impact on the cabin crew than on the pilots. While a handful of close-knit flight attendants could service a 707, up to 20 were needed on the 747. Suddenly they had to provide hot meals for more than 400 at one sitting. A challenge for even the largest restaurants. Fortunately, the 747's wide center galleys and twin aisles made this possible. Flight attendants are no less subject to fatigue than the pilots on the extra long flights. And now Boeing has devised a refuge for them as well. It's called the attic. It's upstairs towards the rear of the aircraft. When we're on long flights we do occasionally get a break and we have a few bunk beds up there which are usually very cosy. It's a race to get the best one though, the darkest one. All of this activity and inactivity occurs while the aircraft is cruising at 900 kilometers an hour, some 11 kilometers above the earth. Outside, the air is too thin to breathe, and the temperature is minus 54 degrees Celsius, or minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet inside, the cabin climate is regulated. Separating these two radically different environments is a skin of tempered aluminium, just two millimeters thick. We keep people comfortable in the passenger cabin by insulating the structure and by taking bleed air off the engines, putting it through the air conditioning units, and then either heating it or cooling it to the right temperature, ducting it through the passenger cabin and exhausting it through the outflow valve. This provides a fresh air change every three minutes. Before beginning their letdown from cruise altitude of 10,500 meters, the pilots review approach procedures, as well as the airport chart detailing the maze of taxiways they will follow to their gate. Once cleared by air traffic control, the captain retards the throttles 
and the 747 begins to descend. The pilot deploys the speed brakes to accelerate the descent. The flight deck is a busy place as the pilots set up for the approach. There are speed adjustments, course changes and radio handoffs. To slow for landing, the co-pilot extends the huge set of triple slotted flaps. Then he lowers the 18-wheeled landing gear. It's possible for the passengers to hear the landing gear as it extends and locks into place. Also, during descent and approach, they can hear changes in engine power and flap deployment. The blue smoke produced by the stationary tyres hitting the runway signals another 747 arrival. In all likelihood, jumbo jets will still be in service for decades to come, with further upgrades in instrumentation, engines, structure and passenger amenities. For example, the 747-400 is fitted with an enhanced ground proximity warning system. This alerts the pilot that the aeroplane is coming too close to mountains or other terrain. So the latest versions of the aeroplane, as an example, have enhanced ground proximity warning system which is a very high-tech way of improving uh, crew avoidance of the ground when they're not sure of their position. The airplane and its systems knows where it is even if the pilot may be confused or if air traffic control might make a mistake. That's the very latest safety enhancement that's going into commercial airliners today and the 747-400 has that. It's a much better airplane now than it was originally and it's proven to be economically uh, desirable. It's a pretty comfortable ride. It's um, easy for pilots to fly and uh, I guess that's uh, the rest is history. It's just more roomy, the ceilings are higher and you don't really feel like you're on a plane, you feel like you're on a, a restaurant in the sky. I feel safer. I feel safer on the 747. I think the majority of passengers, it's their favourite aircraft. Um, some aircraft have a very claustrophobic feel to them when you're inside, especially when you're six foot two like me. No problems on the 747. Plenty of room. The passengers relax more in plenty of room. The cabin crew can do their job better. The perfect aircraft. The 747 uh, is commonly known as a jumbo. Um, it's also a cash cow, um, a big cash cow in that, well, let me put it in perspective. The revenue that we generate at Virgin Atlantic on one round trip of our airplane between New York and London, which is between four and five hundred thousand dollars that we generate on one round trip of the airplane. So it's a lot of money. When we started service in 1984, we only had one airplane to begin with, and, and frankly, choosing the 747 was a bit of a no-brainer. Some airports are reaching maximum operational capacity. During peak hours, their runways simply can't accommodate any additional landings and takeoffs. Since it's the number of aircraft rather than their size that causes constraints, some operators want to use the biggest aeroplane possible. Consequently, interest has grown in developing a super jumbo, one capable of carrying 550 passengers or more. Boeing and others have been talking about expanding the, 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 the size of their biggest airplane for some years now. I, I think it may well be something that has to happen uh, given the constraints at airports. As Director of Product Development at Boeing, David Anderson has unique insights into the 747's future. Look at airplanes larger than the 747 that are designed from scratch. We look at uh, supersonic transports, we look at uh, flying wing type concepts. It looks to me like the airplane that makes the most economic sense is to continually improve the current 747-400. Airbus, the European consortium, is planning a truly massive aircraft. Initially called the A3XX, this super wide-body giant would be fitted with 555 seats or more on two full-length passenger decks. Intended to enter service early this century, 
the Super Airbus would pose a formidable challenge. But Boeing is confident about the viability of its 747. I believe the 747 program is just in its midlife. You'll see this airplane flying another 20 or 30 years from now. It'll be in production for something like 50 years. When Boeing launched the 747 project, the company risked its entire net worth on the aeroplane. The gamble has paid off handsomely. Adjusted for inflation, the aeroplane has generated sales in excess of 100 billion pounds. Boeing regards it as its brightest star. And since the vast majority of sales are to carriers outside the United States, the 747 is also one of America's most important export products. But to most people, the 747 is simply a plane that can be trusted to transport them without incident to their destination. And even now, after all these years, Boeing's remarkable 747 is still to many a thing of wonder.